Thank you, Ethan, and other organizers uh, for including me in this conference. Thank you all for coming. So today I wanted to talk about some uh, very preliminary work that's actually part of a, a much longer, bigger, and perhaps never to be finished project uh, in collaboration with Sean Corcoran, an education economist at NYU, and Howard Rosenthal in the politics department at NYU. And the project really uh, focuses to the extent that a large project can have a focus on uh, roughly the last 30 years of the evolution of the political economy of education finance in the United States. I've seen a lot of changes in sort of the institutional structure of educational finance, intervention from uh, legislative and judicial actors, um, a whole variety of changes across the states that kind of make some very interesting both natural and unnatural experiments. In fact, I'd like to start uh, as a side issue, having looked at some of these, I'd like to actually start a field of unnatural experimentation, which I, could be interesting, but that's a, that's a different talk of um, sort of the Dr. Frankenstein version of econometrics. But in any case, the main themes of the project are on kind of issues of redistribution and the tension between centralization and decentralization in the provision of public goods in general, and education finance in the United States is a very good vehicle for studying lots of these kinds of issues and, and as well as to confront some theoretical models with interesting data and variations in data. Combining, as they do, elements of public economics, policy analysis, political economy, and so on. So in the paper that I'm going to present here today, whose rudiments we uh, basically um, have begun, but there's an enormous amount of data gathering and data cleaning that still has to go on to do sort of a more complete analysis on this. What we're doing is kind of taking as given a theoretical structure that actually goes back several decades in its development, the underlying agenda setter model, and without putting too many bells and whistles on it, seeing how that model, whose early empirical implementation occurred about well, when Rosenthal and I were doing our work back in the 70s and early 80s, using some more recent data to look at some of the um, predictions of that model, and then seeing what happens as the institutional environment in which the model was originally applied to data changes and how that, those changes in the environment both say something about the model and whether the model can say something about the outcomes that come from changes in the institutional environment. So, just to refresh your memory, the model that's underlying this in the simplest form is the basic agenda setter model. And if John Patty were here, I would say to him, thank you very much. Uh, so that's what it is, basic setter model. And, and then he would say, you're welcome. The basic setter model, you're welcome. And uh, in its simplest form, if you imagine that the proposal is being put before voters, is some, say, expenditure budget or something like that that can be arrayed on a, on a real line. And there's some preferences along this line, and there's some pivotal voter whose ideal point is at M. And the proposal is constructed in such a way, the, the expenditure determination model is constructed in such a way that the agenda setter can make a take it or one shot, take it or leave it offer to the voter. Then an attempt to maximize the budget in this case, when there's another feature of the model, which is what happens if the budget proposal fails, we we'll call that the reversion R, then the maximum budget that would pass by a majority would, that would get the support of the pivotal voter would be a point like this. Let's call that XR. I'm going to use a different pointer here, which might work better. Point XR, OK? And in this case, um, under full certainty, lots of other assumptions about the informational structure of the world and the way the proposal works. The most straightforward proposal says when the, the reversion is R, the proposal will be X of R, it'll on average pass, and that will be the budget that's adopted on the assumption that the agenda setter wants to maximize budgets. Now, over the last 30 or so years, this model with lots of Rococo variations can elaborations for uncertainty, issues about whether one correctly perceives this reversion, whether one knows the information about the identity of the pivotal voter, different assumptions about the identity of the proposal, and so on. 
can be, can be developed, but just to kind of tie our hands in a little bit, I'm gonna stick as, as close to this basic model as possible in what I'm gonna do next. And the other feature of this model, of course, is that as the reversion changes, the prediction is that we'll get different outcomes. So for example, at the reversion that's above the ideal point of the pivotal voter, that's the best the agenda setter can do. And so the prediction there would be is that the proposal will be just equal to the reversion. In that case, if the agenda setter has the option not to call an election, he won't do so. Right? He'll just spend the amount or double prime. Okay? So that's, that's kind of the two pieces of the, uh, of the underlying structure. And then to implement this empirically in various contexts, in particular in the context of education finance, think of the sort of most basic public finance world for modeling the provision of education as a local public good, finance by some proportional tax on property or other other sort of local resource, plus possibly grants from the states. And we saw in the previous talk that states provide a fair amount of revenue to localities in the form of grants and aid. So the financing of education in this case consists from the point of view of local school district, which for our purposes is gonna be an independent political entity, but getting resources both locally and from the outside, mostly the state. And so if E is the expenditure of students, number of students, this, everything is gonna be on per student basis except this value V, which is the local tax base, and this value T, which is a tax rate on local property. Now, in addition, we need to say something about how aid is allocated to districts and so on. The, the cleanest way of setting this up is to suppose that this amount A that the district gets may depend on some district characteristics, but in the simplest case is independent of district local effort. Okay. So may, different districts may get different amounts simply because the state aid formula is sensitive to variations in district wealth or something like that, so there could be some redistribution or some compensatory kind of factors in A. But in the cleanest case, whatever that variation is, it's not dependent on how much the district actually spends on education, okay? There are formulas that have that element, but for now we're gonna ignore that. So this is the sort of good old 1960s, 1970s public finance framework that uh, can be made a lot more complicated, but the basic intuitions follow pretty generally from this kind of setup. So in, that, in this world, then from the point of view of an individual in the community with some exogenously given income Y, um, the individual budget constraint is some private consumption plus the amount of taxes that are levied on individuals' holdings of property values, this T, T, T times VI. And then the community budget constraint from the point of view of spending on education is then just given by this, which is total spending on the left side. This is total local revenue, and this is the amount coming in from the outside. Okay, And then thinking back then, sort of, from the point of view of the individual, we can write the budget constraint. It's as if the outside aid is kind of an augment, it's kind of a virtual income addition to private income. And that can be spent either on public pri private goods or on spending per student, where this, this animal PI is what in the public finance literature is called individualized tax price. Okay? So that's effectively from the point of view of an individual who's private portion, whose own portion of the local tax base is VI, that tax price is gonna be just proportional to the ratio of the individual's holding to the total. So people with high property value relative to the mean or to the total are gonna to have higher tax prices than those with lower property values. And so from this you can derive a demand for an individual for education and establish a relationship that specifies the individual's level of spending as some desired amount, E star I, that's a function of this kind of augment, oh, can I get this back on again? All right. This augmented income here that includes the effective value to the individual of the state aid and tax price and lots of other possible characteristics that are either individual or community specific. Okay, so the house, 
So this could be, say, a household characteristics, number of kids in the family, various other attributes of the community. And then the standard median voter story then says that the observed spending should be the median of these demands. Right? So that's the, that's the standard median voter story, which is empirically approximated as some function of median incomes, properly defined median tax prices, and so on. So our long ago empirical work basically implemented this model by saying, suppose as a first cut, you think of the expenditures you actually observed as not necessarily corresponding to the median, but corresponds from a process where we have these referenda where agenda setters make proposals. Voters take, have a take it or leave it option to say, yes, we approve the proposal or we don't. And then that's the end of the game. If the proposal is approved, that's the amount that gets spent. If the proposal is not approved, then the amount available for education spending is whatever this reversion number is. Okay. And as a specification of that, we said, let's suppose we specify the median demand as in some log, log linear form or some other function f. f is usually a log linear function. And we just look at, at an additional variable that does kind of a demand shift, basically, that incorporates the effect of this reversion amount here. So the underlying setter model specification then is something that looks like this, where this function f is often taken to be a log linear function of median income, tax price, and some kitchen sink variables, which I'm, by which I mean all the other kinds of things that you might want to put into the underlying demand function, like uh, family distribution of family sizes, some other attributes of the community, and so on. Okay? Uh, more precisely, in fact, if you recall from the earlier slides, there is kind of, there's a kind of nonlinearity in the specification because we said that at high enough reversions, in particular reversions above the pivotal voters' demand, the agenda, a budget maximizing agenda setter would not actually be able to get approval for an even higher level of spending. And so the best he could do if he were to propose something is to get what the reversion is or maybe not even hold an election if he doesn't have to. So in fact, the actual specification ought to look something like this. That with the previous slide applied for low enough reversions. But for high enough reversions, the best you can do is just stay at the reversions. And so this is sort of the full specification, which looks like kind of in, in an estimation sense, it looks kind of like a sort of a pseudo Tobit. It's not exactly a Tobit specification because the, the, the lower bound here depends on what the reversion is. But it can be estimated in a, in a form that's sort of like a, a, lack, a likelihood uh, maximization that's similar to a Tobit specification. So in what I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you some estimates that essentially use a setup like this to estimate this model. And then the interesting question we have is obviously, for us, we're not that interested in what the rest of the specification here looks like, but rather on something about the coefficients on beta 1, which ought to be, in the setter model, ought to be negative right, in the strict setter model. Right, that higher reversions reduce the threat position of the setter in the region in which the reversion is below the median or pivotal voters' demand. And in fact, um, that's what we did back in our earlier work. We essentially did all sorts of variations on this. We also looked at a whole bunch of things like when elections are held, when they're not held, how often they're held, and things like that, most of which also uh, predictions about most of which also come out of the setter model. I won't discuss those today. But there's a whole host of sort of ancillary predictions that were also more or less supported by the data we were using. And the data that we were using then came out of a fortuitous discovery that in the state of Oregon, in fact, the institutions for educational finance, at least in the 70s, looked almost exactly like the model I just wrote down okay. in terms of the fact that um, a large chunk of elementary and secondary schools were financed largely from local property taxes. State aid was on the order of a third or so of the total. First of all, first of all. second, aid itself from the state 
was pretty much exogenous to local effort. Okay? So there were lump sums. The lump sums differed by districts, but on, in ways that didn't depend on local effort. That school districts were independent political units. And that school districts, in deciding their budgets, had to, had to have an electoral process, had to have referenda of the type we were talking about at the end of the question period in the previous session, namely that if the local school board wanted to levy taxes above a certain amount, they were required to ask the voters for permission. But if they wanted to stay at or below that amount, they did not have to go to the voters. Okay? So, and this amount was called something, something that was called the base. So for amounts inside the base, no votes were required. For votes outside the base, voter approval was required. And the base was defined originally for most districts by a number that was written down in 1916, okay, according to some state constitutional provision in 1916. Okay. Second, that number exogenously incremented by 6% in nominal dollars. It wasn't per student, wasn't corrected for inflation. It was just some number, say, whatever that number was in 1916, and then grew at 6% in nominal dollars. And in more recent years, it could be changed by voter approval in base elections, which then would redefine the base, which then would grow in 6%. But those, those were rare. And I'm not, we have a, another part of the future part of this paper that will talk about those. But in this period, they were pretty rare. And um, I will just leave those aside. Maybe in the Q&A, I can come back to what happens once you start having base elections. But if, anyway. Um, for our purposes, we're going to think of these as essentially exogenous numbers. And the, the interesting part of this is that for many districts, this base number was zero, for example, because the district didn't exist in 1916. So if you were born later than 1916 as a school district, you started out with a zero base. Second, if you merged with another district, two districts that merged, their bases were reset to zero because it was defined as a new district. Okay? So some districts that were relatively large and stayed as school districts in 1916 had large bases. Other districts had small bases. So we get this ver nice variation in districts. Um, and so for our purposes, in the, in the agenda setter framework, we can think of the base together with state aid, which you get, whether or not you've passed your election, you can claim your state aid as long as you <laughs> operate the schools. We'll call those together as the reversion, which is the amount of revenue available for operating schools that does not require voter approval. Okay. And then using this setup, setup using data from the early 1970s, we examined various aspects of the setter model, and we found for the early 70s that that coefficient beta 1 was approximately 0.1, something like that. Okay. Um, negative 0.1. So it ranges between minus 0.08 and minus 0.15, again, depending on the exact specification. So that's what I want to keep it in the background. And then what I want to show you today is some new estimates from the 1980s. So part of this was we went into this as a kind of ridiculously foolhardy attempt to say, well, wouldn't it be interesting if we, 30 years later, replicated earlier work? Okay. I don't recommend it as a general exercise, but it was kind of just an interesting thing we started. And then as we went along, we stumbled on to the fact that actually there's a good other reason to do this. So what I'm going to show you now is some new estimates from the 1980s that are data on annual cross-sections of about 120 school districts that are all K through 12 unified districts of a certain size or higher. Okay. And the first set of results is pretty much the specification we have for 85 and 86. The other years are somewhat similar to the earlier years. So this is the earlier part of this period. And the key feature here is, again, that this coefficient on the reversion variable is, again, on the order of the magnitudes we found in our earlier work. So that's kind of refreshing. You, know, you wouldn't have expected that going out another 14 years or so, we would get a pretty similar set of results as we had earlier. Then these are the coefficients on essentially income and price variables. This would, you could think of this as the part of the specification that comes from the demand side of the, of the model. 
And so that's, that's pretty, pretty much uh, kind of what we found earlier. And the results for 82 and 84 are roughly similar. I'm not going to clutter the table there in the paper. Okay, so these are, again, unified districts with um, on average about 200 or more students. Some school districts are small, some school districts are, di are, are large. We did a little more playing around with the specification of this by adding other what I call kitchen sink variables like the percent of older people in the district. There's not much racial variation in these kinds of cases, so we didn't do a lot with that. Um, but not much changes in the important characteristics of the story. The next table I want to show you I'm not going to have time to talk about most of what's in here, but what, what this shows you is for this period, 83 through 86, the distribution of change in local levies in these districts. And this basically says, for each of these categories, what percentage of school districts actually changed their levies by this amount from the previous year? So in this column, we have what fraction of districts exactly incremented their spending by 6% in nominal terms, not on per student terms. Okay? So roughly between a quarter and a third of the district just simply bumped up by 6% from the previous year. Very few spent exactly the same amount. And I will fill in the rest of these table, rest of this table later just to show you some interesting changes. So since I'm a little bit short on time, let me skip ahead and talk about the inst institutional change that happened during the middle of this period of the 80s. So during the mid-1980s, as inflation kind of subsided, and these reversions kept going up by 6% in districts that were already at high reversions, saw increasing tensions between voters and school boards, and particularly in some of those cases where reversions were not going up at all because they were low reversions at all, but spending kept going up, okay? Because they were passing budgets to prevent the closing of schools, and in some cases, in extreme and highly visible cases, there was so much tension between agenda setters and the schools, the, the, the local voters, that they actually played a game of brinksmanship. And in some cases, schools actually failed to pass budgets so that by November, December, January, they still didn't have a budget. And by March, they were starting to shut down the schools. So those were just the most extreme and highly visible cases. But there were lots of evidence. There was lots of inc incidents. If you look at, if you read some of the kind of newspapers at the time, where there's a lot of tension between voters and school boards. And this led, in 1987, to the passage of a constitutional amendment in Oregon called Measure 2 that was meant to continue existing levies to prevent school closures. It was supported by the governor, business associations, and so on. If you read the paper, we have some quotes from uh, arguments that the gun at the head of approach has created hard feelings between voters and school boards. And they point to the structure of school finance as one of the reasons why this is happening. You have these districts with low reversions that have to kind of go to the voters all the time to get more money and, and so on. It turned out a little later that um, we found out that, in fact, some people were citing our earlier work to sort of buttress their case. And they didn't come to us to ask what they should do about this. But they apparently, some people used the argument that, you know, that these agenda setters were actually trying to squeeze the voters and the voters were reacting in bad ways and all this other stuff. But in any case, the institutional change that happened created something called the safety net. And the safety net was in principle something that allows the district, without requiring voter approval, to levy taxes that do not exceed the previous levy. So this basically redefines the reversion rules so that now, although the base number that constitutionally defined base number is not changed. The safety net provision changes the reversion starting with the 87-88 school year in such a way that the effective reversion now is given by this formula, which is essentially that you can spend either, your reversion becomes either the larger of what you were spending last year per student or your base per student. Okay. So that even a district with a low base can have a high reversion since they can, if, although their base is low, their last year spending can just be continued without asking the voters for approval. Okay. Now, 
You might think this also sets up interesting dynamics that you know now the reversion is this year's spending becomes next year's reversion. We kind of, in this story, we kind of ignore that since we're looking at the short run effects of this, maybe in a longer term sense, but that ought to also be taken into account in terms of thinking about the proposal that the setter would, would make. But I want to just show you what happens if we now continue the specification for 87 and onwards using this formula for the reversion rather than the original formula. Okay, so this is the, then the next couple of years. Notice the complete change in the estimates on the coefficient beta. So instead of being negative, it's now positive. And the other interesting part of this is that these demand effects essentially disappear from the specification. So that partly what's happening is that a lot of districts are now moving into what is called the safety net. Right? That now you just continue to spend what you were allowed to spend last year because your reversion is low. Five minutes. Very good. And if the 1989 and 1980 and 1990 numbers are roughly similar, again, with the demand effects essentially disappearing, as the model would predict that the demand effects would disappear once you have this option. And then the last couple of things that are worth noting here is that in this table, in terms of the distribution of local levies that I showed you before, focusing again, you have an increase in the number of districts, the fraction of districts that just keep spending their 6% exactly, more and more of 6%, and then going from essentially almost no district spending the previous, what they were spending before, to a substantial number of districts just exactly spending what they were spending the previous year. Okay, uh, I have about three minutes, four minutes. Okay, the, um, so the next part of this project is to talk about what are the, the longer-term implications of what's going on here. And I will go to this, which is, so this is a count, just a count of the number of districts that actually voted more than the amount their reversion would allow them to do. And you see that roughly about between a, roughly a half of the districts in our sample through 1986 were regularly going outside their budget, that is that they were passing elections. And that number kept, goes down significantly as you get into the 90s. And by the 90s, very few local elections are held at all. So the question is, what is happening here? Is this that basically the agenda setter has kind of given up? Is, is this a story about the, the agenda setter just basically no longer even trying to pass budget? Or is it also, essentially the agenda that are not giving the voters a chance to actually approve budgets. So we're still, we're still trying to sort this out. So the question that kind of gets back to the title of the paper, is this the twilight of the setter or some kind of voter demerung that's happening here, right? Which of them is actually going off to Valhalla in flames in this story? The, the last piece of this is that if I want to just kind of go on as we're following this story, this sort of unraveling of the institutions of education finance in the state. Um, if we go up to the 1990s, prior to this period, there were several, a series of failed attempts starting in the 1970s in Oregon to pass tax limit, sort of statewide tax limitations a la Prop 13 in California. In fact, right around the time of Prop 13, there was an attempt, which failed, several successive attempts failed. But by 1990, it did, there was a successful tax limitation. Uh, local districts were then severely constrained by this tax limitation. The new state aid formula was adopted by the legislator in 92 and 91, so that effective 92, this whole reversion system kind of has been kind of unraveled in an important way. Although it was still in place, so much of state of school finance had shifted from the localities to the, to, to, to the state government that most of the money coming into districts was now coming from state rather than from local sources. So that the last picture I want to leave you with is the pattern of state versus local funding in Oregon in the era I was talking about before it was here, and in the new era post-1990, we're down here, just a complete reversal. And this has happened, by the way, in quite a few states in the US where there was this big flip between mostly local to mostly state financing. And one of, that's one of the effects of tax limitations that essentially removes taxing authority to a large extent at the local level, really constrains it. But school financing has to come from somewhere. 
the attention shifts, uh, shifts to state politics and a very different kind of um, budget setting. So the next phase of this project is to see how the shift of school finance to the state level rather than to the local level has affected sort of the, pa the pattern and composition of expenditures. And since this is a conference about constitutions and the impact of constitutional change, where the rubber hits the road, at least in state expenditures, is very heavily in education finance. And so one of the effects of that, that I want to emphasize here is that these seemingly innocuous changes in things like reversion rules and, and, the, and the kind of incentives they create for, um, for um, the process of expenditures and, and the kind of then repercussions they have for statewide politics can have big quantitative as well as qualitative effects. I'll stop there. Right, thanks for inviting me for the discussion. It's a very interesting paper. Um, the paper is relatively in the early stage, so I'm going to focus primarily on uh, making suggestions about what can be added to the paper. So I'm going to um, start with a very, brief, a, discuss, a very brief summary of what the paper is about. So the paper is about the local school public finance in Oregon, and uh, they do the analysis using the classic gender set model by Romo and Rosenthal. And specifically, it's about a rule change uh, that, is, uh, that is measured too in 1987 that created something that is called a safety net. And conceptually, essentially what it did is to change uh, the reversion point in the school public finance. So before the rule change in 1987, the reversion point for the expenditure uh, per student was the combination of the base that was specified in 1916 Constitution and the state aid. And this base uh, was basically the level in 1916 that was raised, that uh, is automatically raised by 6% uh, 6 per year in the nominal term. And now, after the change, uh, the reversion uh, point changes a little bit. Uh, because they can now use the uh, level of the previous year as a reversion point. Okay, so whatever um, that is bigger can be used as a reversion point under um, the uh, new regime after the measure two. So that is the uh, the essential change uh, that occurred in 1987. So uh, let me uh, start uh, making suggestions, talking about uh, this um, the discussion of what's special about Oregon. So I think that when a study focuses on one state, uh, the most appealing situation is to have uh, the situation in which the state gives a very unique opportunity to draw a conclusion that is very general, that has a very broad implication. So um, I think it, it, the paper would be even more interesting if uh, the, the authors put more discussion about what's really unique about Oregon, what's really the broad implication of this change that happened in Oregon. And the authors indeed um, have some discussion about what's really unique. So let's, uh, let's first look at it and let's uh, try to think about how, this, how it is related to situations that are happening in other um, states. So Oregon, um, in 1980s, Oregon has this dubious distinction of being the only state in the nation that closed its schools for the lack of the money. And it also had some sort of peculiar structure in the tax system. So the tax says that uh, it has this prominence uh, of the ta property tax because of this structure that it has no sales tax in the state level, okay? Right, so um, based on the tax, it kind of looks like Oregon is a very unique uh, situation. So it's, uh, it's, it becomes a very good enough reason to focus on Oregon. But at the same time, there's a way to actually link it to more general situations. So when you think about um, the recent situations related to the budget problem, there are other cases that actually closed the school. For example, the city of Chicago closed, uh, decided to close more than 50 schools this year. And the city of Philadelphia closed about 10% of the public schools this year. Uh, due to the budget problem. So I think it would be nice to uh, talk about, it would be nice to have some discussion about how um, this situation of the, the, the school closure is all related to each other and what kind of broad implication this situation of Oregon has in terms of the institutional design of the local public uh, school finance and, um, and the future of those states that have, the localities and the states that have huge budget problems. And um, 
in general, I think it would be better, it would be very helpful to the readers if the authors could make the uniqueness of the situation more clear. So it looks like Oregon had a huge budget crisis in 1980s. Was it really general? I guess that um, there may have been other states that, that also had a huge, prob or huge problems in terms of budget. And what's the sort of a, a feature of the income distribution and the uh, feature of the tax system that makes the Oregon really unique compared with other states that had similar problems? Or is it the case that the states have um, some institutional features like the ballot measures, only half of the states have ballot measures. So what's the institutional features of the Oregon that actually um, make this a state more subject to this kind of a, a very um, interesting situation? So that kind of discussion would help readers understand the general implication and the sort of a, a very appealing feature of, of, of Oregon uh, more interesting. And I would also want to know better about the causes of this change because this, uh, the, the rule change is so interesting. So um, the text has this description that this rule change was generally caused by the school closure due to budget shortfalls and the, uh, general strains in the budget process um, in Oregon. And thinking about it in the context of the gender center model, it, it feel like it's this cause of the rule change is not uh, entirely in the baseline agenda center model. So in the agenda center model, if the reversion point is very unattractive to the degree that the school closure happens, then the, ma the budget ma maximizing agenda center can actually propose a pretty high level of budget and get it passed. So the school co closure it's not really the, the kind of feature that I would um, naturally draw from the baseline agenda set the model. So there must be something that is uh, actually outside the agenda set the model that is described in the paper. So um, I tried to look at the details of what was actually happening at that time and what's really peculiar about this Oregon uh, situation. So it turns out that there was actually huge disparity in the local uh, property tax. For example, in 1970s, there was already uh, a state, a Supreme Court case in which the plaintiffs um, were arguing that the, the local uh, property tax system is causing a huge discrimination against the tax poor districts. So if you look at Oregon, uh, Oregon the state of Oregon, there are districts that have um, a, uh, a very good natural resources like timber, and there are, there are districts that, have, that do not have this kind of natural resources. So if you look at the situation of 1984, for example, for example, um, there are situations, there are districts in which um, the district had a lot of natural resources, so they could actually pay very, very low tax um, per, um, per, per, uh, per 1,000, sorry. For 1,000 value, and there were situations, there were districts in which the district was very, very poor. So in those kind of communities, they actually had to pay very, uh, very high property tax. So if you look at this amount, then you can see a huge disparity in the level of the local property tax. And it seems that this pay became a, a sort of backdrop for this rule change. And if you look at the details of exactly what happened, actually this. Um, this measure two passed with only 55% of uh, the approval by the voters. So 45% of the voters were opposed uh, to this rule change. So on top of thinking about uh, describing this backdrop, this background, I think it would be nice to look at uh, what districts were actually opposed to this rule change and what districts were um, um, in favor of this rule change and how it's also related to the base amount. So, um, so this leads to a question of um, what are the districts that actually use this uh, safety net, the default amount from the previous year, and about 20% of the districts use this safety net, and it's kind of not right now in the uh, exposition in the current version. It's not very easy to see um, how that changed the state. Um, uh, the, how, change, how that changed the district level revenue and expenditure because it's actually combined with the general change uh, that is the um, shift of the local power to the state power. 
So it would be nice to see more uh, clear description of exactly how the revenue and expenditure changed in each, in each set of districts and uh, see that pattern across different, um, see the pattern across the districts with different um, proportion of the voters who approved um, this kind of a, a rule change. And there was a very peculiar feature in the base amount that was specified in 1916 constitution. So for the districts that uh, were created after 1916, the base amount is zero, which is very unattractive. So it would be nice to see if the, um, the use, how the usage of this uh, safety net was related to the base amount, this peculiar base amount that was uh, specified in 1916 constitution. All right. So. Um, Tomo also already mentioned this uh, dynamic feature. So there's this feature, uh, there's this aspect of this rule change that once you increase the budget, that kind of change the, changes the reversion point for the whole period. So I understand that it's kind of um, beyond the scope of this paper to incorporate this dynamic incentive into the model. But I think it is still be interesting to see how that changes the sort of overall trajectory of the budget. And because there's a change in 1990, it's kind of hard to do that, but we can sort of uh, compare the sort of uh, um, level of the expenditure and, and revenue with the, the, the sort of trajectory before the rule change and see how that affects the fluctuation, the fluctuation of the uh, revenue and expenditure. And it will also be, it would be also be nice to see um, how the trajectory, the stability of the trajectory is related to the overall base amount that was specified in 1916, okay? The base, base level in 1916. And um, so in the end, we want to understand what was the sort of long-term uh, welfare consequences of this uh, rule change was. And it's kind of hard to think about counterfactual in the reduced form, but still we can try to do some sort of back of the envelope calculation. So uh, once we establish the relationship between the base amount um, in 1916 and the sort of pattern of the usage of the safety net, then we can sort of try to do a back of the envelope calculation of what the budget level would have been like if, if we did not, did not have this rule change. So that would be a sort of a, a very interesting, informative exercise to do, I guess. Right. So uh, now let me get into more of the details. So there's this figure um, about the, um, the, the sort of result of this rule change, measure two. And this is very informative, but I think that it would be nice to have um, a figure about uh, uh, the change in the amount of the local revenue that is not about the proportion. So if you look at this one, you can see that this, uh, this change here had a huge consequence that is also associated with the rule change in 1990. But just looking at the proportion of the local revenue, you cannot really see how that actually changed the sort of uh, the structure of the local revenue and the, the amount of the local revenue and the structure of the composition of the local revenue and the state revenue, et cetera, for different districts. So along with this figure, I think it would be nice to have the, the sort of figure based on the actual amount of the local revenue and actual amount of the state uh, aid that is uh, that, that was changed in response to this, um, this change in the local revenue. And it would be nice to see this pattern across different across different districts with different characteristics. And on top of it, I see that there uh, seems to be some sort of trend going on. So if you look at this period before late 1970s, there's some, a decreasing huge notable trend in here. And there's another trend that is actually going up. So to the extent that it's all combined with various trends, it's kind of hard to see how this trend is all interacting with the changes at the local level. So um, some more description of what's happening in uh, the subgroup of the district would be very helpful, I guess. All right, so um, one minor co comment that I have is, um, is that this, this table obviously shows a very interesting, uh, very important point, which is that as a result of this measure two, we could see more district that are just uh, sticking to the previ previous amount of expenditure and the revenue. Um, so that's very informative, but at the same time, I think it would be nice to have um, a separate table 
about um, the changes as a continuous, the actual changes in the amount as a continuous variable along with this table that would uh, give a more concrete picture of exactly what's going on, okay? So uh, I have one final suggestion which is about the welfare and in inequality. So this is um, because this is about the education finance. In the end, what matters is, is the welfare of the students and the quality of the education. So, uh, it may be a little bit uh, beyond the scope of this paper, but, but I think it would be uh, very nice to have some sort of a discussion about what, uh, what was the change that we could observe in terms of the staffing of the schools and the quality of the education, et cetera, some measures that can be roughly related to the welfare of the students. And um, uh, it's, it would be also good to have some sort of a um, discussion about inequality across different districts because inequality in the uh, property tax was what actually caused this rule change. So it'd be nice to see um, how the um, disparity in the expenditure and revenue changed across different districts overall, and how the, 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 uh, the change that happened in 1990 sort of responded to this, um, this uh, changes in the disparities across different districts. So that would be, um, that would make uh, this paper even more interesting. So that is it. So thanks once again. Um, I want to do something a little bit different from what Claire did with this paper. I want to use Tom's paper as a bit of a jumping off point to bring out some questions about the historical and normative issues uh, involved with this paper uh, on issues of constitutional design and policy outcomes. Um, what I'm going to be talking about really is kind of examining a, uh, a kind of a normative posture uh, that this paper takes, um, suggesting that perhaps we might be able to use this normative posture um, to evaluate the historical development of the policies of school finance in Oregon, uh, but also to uh, take a little bit different stand uh, as well about uh, the kind of normative ideas that might lie behind these kind of constitutional provisions uh, in school finance. The question really here is, what are the principles that did and what are the principles that should guide institutional design? Uh, here we have a particular institutional design of how the school financing process works uh, in the state of Oregon. Um, Romer and Rosenthal offer a particular uh, notion of what the principles should be uh, that guided, uh, perhaps historically, or that should guide normatively uh, the institutional design in school finance, and that is that the uh, principles, uh, or that the uh, institutional design should uh, cause outcomes to reflect the expenditure preferences of the median voter. So this was a decision that was made in 1916 in Oregon uh, as a result of a constitutional convention. Uh, and as uh, this paper shows and as the earlier work shows, uh, this old system favored service providers, uh, favored high demanders, uh, favored school districts and school boards, um, which led to a situation where kind of reading between the lines, uh, one might argue that there was an overinvestment uh, in schools uh, in Oregon uh, for a considerable period of time. Uh, that raises the question, of course, about what the motivations were of the architects of this system uh, back in 1916. Uh, I'm going to call it the base system because that's kind of the key um, um, sort of uh, descriptor uh, that this paper uses uh, to talk about the reversion point. Uh, this was a system essentially that set a historical baseline and then grew forward the level of funding uh, that did not require voter approval from that uh, particular baseline. And if you look back on it, it seems to, this is a decision that seems to reflect two kind of um, uh, competing uh, objectives uh, for the designers of this constitutional system. Uh, the first was the desire to provide what might one might call adequate funding uh, for the schools themselves. And so there was a notion that there should be a level below which uh, school funding uh, did not fall. Um, likewise, there seemed to be as well a desire to contain spending. Uh, so it shouldn't simply be uh, left up to the school districts themselves uh, to decide or the school boards themselves to decide what the level of taxation for schools should be, uh, but rather uh, for uh, outsized increases uh, in school funding, those should be submitted uh, for voters' approval. Uh, and so there seemed to be a bit of distrust of both actors um, in setting up this constitutional system, both a distrust of the school boards, that the school boards themselves would set taxes too high if they had the unfettered power to do so, 
um, and that the voters themselves also uh, would perhaps not provide adequate funding uh, for schools unless they were forced to do so. Now, as this paper and the earlier work shows, the actual effect uh, in striking this balance was one that turned out to be in favor of the school boards, uh, at least by uh, the lights of the normative principle that the expenditure levels uh, on schools should reflect the preference uh, of the median voter. Uh, this was a perversity that the state of Oregon lived with for 70 years, um, which I think is a kind of interesting observation. Um, it's, I'm kind of curious, in fact, uh, not being so familiar with the earlier work, uh, whether this was something that nobody ever noticed, uh, that this was a system that did give uh, considerable power uh, to the school boards, um, whether it was not an issue before in other kind of pressing economic circumstances, uh, in particular uh, during the Great Depression um, or in Oregon soon after the creation of the system uh, in the early 20s uh, when the, there was a the post-war uh, economic uh, recession. Uh, but that's really a historical question, um, but one that I will come back to uh, in just a moment. Um, it also occurred to me in looking through the paper that there was a perversity built into the system of another sort, um, and that was the kind of crazy way in which the base was set to zero um, in new school districts or in consolidated school districts. And when I first read that, I thought, why in the world would you have any consolidation at all in Oregon? And that was kind of my first reaction. Uh, the, the reward for consolidating your school districts, uh, presumably for efficiency reasons, would be that your base gets set to zero. Why would you ever do that? But then when I started to think about the message of this paper uh, and the message of the uh, setter model, um, on second thought, it would seem that this would have encouraged uh, school consolidations because the lower the reversion point is set, uh, the more advantage it gives to the agenda setter in making these uh, take it or leave it uh, offers um, and therefore uh, hiking up uh, the levies uh, for the schools. Um, I did take a look at some of the historical data on school consolidations. Uh, it didn't look to me like there was any enormous difference between the uh, kind of time pattern of school consolidations in Oregon uh, versus other states. I'm originally from Kansas, a place that has found it very difficult to consolidate its schools. Um, but uh, it seemed to me to be a, an, another sort of interesting issue that uh, perhaps uh, Tom and his co-authors have already looked into. Now, the paper says something about, uh, says quite a lot, in fact, about the motivation for the change in the uh, rules that govern uh, approval for uh, increases in school budgets uh, in the 1980s. Uh, and as they point out, um, and in fact, uh, as Tom mentioned in his presentation, um, it can be read as a concern exactly about the kind of perversities uh, that Romer and Rosenthal identified uh, in the system of uh, Oregon school finance. Uh, that is the ability to use the threat of closure uh, a very low reversion point, the ability to use the threat of closure uh, as a way of uh, generating higher spending uh, for education. Um, it can certainly be read that way in part by looking at the coalitions uh, behind this change, uh, how it was being pushed in particular by business groups that uh, were presumably concerned about high levels of taxation uh, and about the divisions among the school boards themselves, a uh, very close vote uh, on whether to endorse this uh, amendment or not. Uh, on the part of the state organization of school boards. Now, from the standpoint of the normative principles back of this paper, uh, namely that expenditure levels should reflect the preference of the median voter, uh, the new system uh, for uh, setting the reversion point uh, in these school finance negotiations uh, was presumably an improvement uh, over the previous system. Uh, the reversion points would thereby be higher uh, and therefore the actual expenditures presumably closer to the expenditures desired by the median voter. Um, now, this particular paper doesn't say that it is, um, and this particular paper doesn't give us any comparative statics to sort of indicate uh, how the outcomes uh, looked similar or looked different uh, as a result of this institutional change. Uh, and that would be something that I would think uh, would be uh, part of a subsequent uh, revision of this paper. Um, now, what's also interesting, though, about the campaign that led to the change in this rule was that it was not presented um, entirely at least, it was not presented as a way of sort of dealing with this perversity. It was presented as a way of helping school districts. It was represented as a safety net, uh, that there would be a point below which uh, school districts would not be able to fall. Uh, and whether that was simply pure public relations uh, or whether there was something more substantive behind it, 
uh, is a little difficult uh, to tell. Uh, nevertheless, the school districts seem not to have experienced it as a safety net. Um, and in fact, uh, Tom notes in the paper that by 1990, there was even a Republican gubernatorial candidate who began to refer to the safety net as the safety noose, um, the kind of uh, uh, slow strangulation, if you will, uh, of uh, the school districts. Um, so um, according to this model, uh, if it is in fact a safety net, uh, then presumably what's happening uh, is the reversion point is above the level that would be approved in a referendum. Um, that is, voters in fact want uh, the same or lower spending uh, than is currently the case. Uh, and for educators, it was something that they clearly saw as uh, not being sufficient uh, for their needs. Um, well, this conflict between what voters want and what educators want um, actually suggests another principle of institutional design that constitutional designers might well have uh, been thinking about historically or might well have wanted to adopt uh, as a normative uh, issue. Um, suppose that we suspect that the expenditure preference for education on the part of the median voter uh, that that level of expenditure is actually suboptimal socially. Um, that in fact there's a social benefit uh, from education uh, that is not fully internalized uh, by voters and by the median voter in particular. And there are a couple of reasons why people might suspect that the expenditures that would be favored by the median voter would be below the social benefit of education. Uh, the one is simply that education is argued at least to have public benefits as well as private benefits. The benefits do not accrue entirely or only to the people who receive the education, but there are some broader social benefits that arise from education as well. Uh, a second reason has to do with time horizon, uh, that the kinds of decisions that voters are making about investment in education are basically invest, investments in the human capital of people um, and the kind of social capital of people uh, that will only be realized in the future uh, by those generations and by succeeding generations um, and not by the uh, decision makers, the current decision makers themselves. And so there are a couple of reasons why you might imagine that people would suspect that the preference of the median voter do not fully uh, reflect uh, the social benefits of education. So that then raises another principle, another possibility for a principle that would guide constitutional design in school finance, and that is that the principle uh, or that the institutional design be such uh, that the actual expenditure uh, reflects the full social value of education uh, for the local society. Um, if that were the case, then you would, I think, very quickly conclude that you couldn't count on the referendum, uh, you couldn't count on voter preferences as uh, the indicator um, or of what the optimal level uh, of funding ought to be. Um, whether the uh, median voter is reflective of or the median voter's preference uh, corresponds to the social value of education or not is going to depend clearly upon the characteristics of the median voter. Um, on income, on tax price, on children, and so forth. Um, and so it might be higher, it might be lower, uh, but one might argue uh, that over some considerable stretches of time uh, that it would in fact be lower uh, than the social value uh, of the education expenditure itself. Um, so from that, step back then to the historical situation of constitutional designers uh, in 1916. And suppose that you are a constitutional designer in 1916 and you're trying to adopt a forward-looking constitutional design to govern school finance uh, in Oregon uh, for some uh, considerable period of time. Um, well, uh, this was, of course, a progressive period. Uh, this was a period uh, following upon a very successful and very controversial progressive democratic governor of Oregon, I looked this up, I didn't know this, uh, but uh, following upon um, the implementation of a number of progressive measures, including the initiative and referendum um, under the uh, leadership of a Democratic governor. Uh, the governor at the time of 1916 uh, seems to have been a fairly conservative Republican, uh, as nearly as I can tell, uh, but this was certainly uh, a movement that had a very strong influence in Oregon as it did uh, in other parts of the country. Um, so if you are such a uh, progressive uh, decision maker and thinking about issues of constitutional design in 1916, 
Uh, it seems that you might want to accomplish two things, uh, given the kind of preferences that progressives uh, tended to have. The first is that one might want to keep government agencies on a fairly short leash. Uh, one of the great values that progressives had was efficiency um, and wanting to make sure that public resources were used uh, in an efficient fashion. Uh, but you might likewise uh, want to bring uh, expenditures in public schooling uh, into line with social benefits. Um, and that is that you wouldn't necessarily trust uh, that the voters are necessarily going to get it right uh, in terms of the actual investment that ought to be made in public education. And that might then cause you uh, actually, uh, as a thought, in a thoughtful way, uh, to put more resources or to put more power uh, in the hands of the experts. And of course, progressives loved experts. Uh, that was another kind of uh, aspect uh, of, the, of the progressives. They weren't populist in that way. They, they tended to uh, uh, see a lot of virtue to expert knowledge. That is, you might want to put more power um, into the hands of educators. And so you might well, as a matter of deliberate choice, uh, have gotten a system uh, that looks a little like the base system um, uh, that, uh, was actually, uh, that was actually created. And so it's possible, at least, that the perversities that uh, the system ended up having uh, relative to the principle that school expenditures um, should reflect the preferences of the median voter uh, were in fact built into the system uh, as an intentional uh, choice, uh, not because people did not um, see that coming or uh, people did not want to have it that way um, and it was unintended, uh, but rather because the policymakers were pursuing uh, a different vision, a different principle of what the uh, constitutional design should achieve. So those are my comments. Thanks. So. Um there's one, one picture that I meant to show, but it's not quite complete, so I didn't know whether it was worth pointing up. But um, in particular, so what happens to districts that are in the safety net with, versus those that aren't, that Claire mentioned. And we're sort of pursuing that as sort of see if there's something systematically different about them and if they behave differently later. Uh, let me see if I can get out of here. So here we have, we, we're sort of tracking um, the for student expenditure growth over this period. And um, so this is all districts up to here, because nobody's in the safety net. And then from here on in, it's the districts. These are the districts not in the safety net, and these are the districts in the safety net. So their system, I mean, expenditures per students are, are dropping for various reasons out of macro, kind of ex partly macro, ec state of Oregon macro explanation. But the districts that are in the safety net are actually being squeezed more than those that aren't. And this is partly also where this quote about the becoming a safety noose for some of them. And what sort of the, the setter model interpretation is that, well, these, these guys were, you know, had they, had they been, you know, and the, and the, they were in some sense, they were, you know, they were just tracking their, what the best they could do by not even going to the voters. Had they gone to the voters, presumably they didn't think they could get more. These guys were had the high enough reversions to get to get better than what they could get under the safety net. So in both cases, expenditures were 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 either slowing down or dropping, but the safety net did have the effect of curtailing expenditures even in those districts, in, in, in the districts uh, relative to the non-safety net districts. But these are also districts that probably had pretty low reversions, so they they were still probably better off at this point going to the safety net than going through the, what had now become a very, the very contentious politics of local school finance. The idea of, of then also incorporating into the, the full derivation of what the optimal proposal is, suppose you're still a budget maximizing setter, but now you, ha you have the option of using last year's expenditures, how does that affect as, as your reversion for next year? That's actually, a, I mean, there's papers that have kind of worked that out, and in fact, we worked it out a long time ago, the reason that we didn't fully implement it in this empiric estimation is because this system collapsed after about three year, two, year, two or three years. So that there's not much we're going to learn from the data about working out that fully dynamic model. But there is a more dynamic specification that might be interesting to do. The other thing that we haven't done that would be nice to do is figure out a way of how to embed this sort of nonlinear maximum likelihood sort of switching kind of model into a, into a panel estimation. And if anybody, any kind of the econometricians in the room know how how that's a, that's a way to do that, I'd be, in an efficient way, I'd 
like to know. So far, we've just done a sequence of cross sections, but ideally, we'd like to do this as a panel estimation, but preserve the underlying theoretical structure of the specification, which has this kind of um, switching aspect to some extent. Um, anyway, so that's a that's a question in general, but we're working on that. Um, Yes, it's also true, obviously, in the, in the full information version of this model, a school closure is not on the equilibrium path, right? Because um, the setter, would, the setter in, in a one-shot game, certainly, the setter would just propose epsilon less than what would require uh, voters to prefer closing the schools to keeping the schools open. In earlier work, we have sort of um, uncertainty versions or, or somewhat stochastic versions of this model where, in fact, it's, there's some chance that the schools can close. And on that, on that path, you do observe some school closures. Uh, there's no, we didn't incorporate that in this estimation, but it's clear what, what was happening is that there was clearly something happening in the, net, in the 85, 86 period that led to at least a couple of these districts to have sort of repeated, repeated, repeated instances where uh, voters and the school board were just on just diametrically opposed on the kinds of things that they wanted to happen in the schools. And I think that, that those weren't the only triggering effects that then led to measure two, but they were the most salient ones because they, they received national media coverage about how all these poor kids in Oregon were kind of trapped between <laughs> what voters were doing and what the budget um, administrators were trying to do. But I think what was happening is that um, a sub-feature of this that we didn't model here, but in our earlier work we actually did, that in cases where, even where cases where the schools didn't close, the, set, the, the setters required two or three attempts to pass a budget. One budget would fail and then it would try again and eventually they would pass so the schools wouldn't close. As they get closer and closer to September, the likelihood of passage goes up in those, in those districts. Um, yes, we are, we are looking, we're trying to get data which turns out to be surprisingly hard in the actual campaign and passage for the Constitutional Amendment Measure 2 and which districts supported and opposed. And nobody seemed to think it was useful to keep district-level data on who voted, uh, what, the, what the vote counts were. They just did county-wide county -wide totals. And so we don't quite have it at the school district level. And we're sort of digging around to see if we can get district by district um, ballots, ballot outcomes on Measure 2 itself. Um, what else? Uh, Yes, it'd be nice to get sort of school school level outcomes. I don't think those are going to be easy to find for the 1980s and, and early 90s. More recent, there's, there's a more recent interest in sort of figuring out what what various outcome measures are useful and how to get them in different types of schools. I think that's going to be unlikely uh, for the late 80s and even the early 90s. But it's a good idea. Uh, and then our larger project is actually a project that tracks the evolution of these various interventions in, in, in across district inequality and how those have changed over time by various measures of inequality. And Oregon is one of those, one of those uh, in the larger study. Mark, well, yes, and thank you for kind of situating us back in sort of where, this, where these uh, sort of ideas for why this ex post seemingly bizarre 1916 rule might, might have come from. I think that's a very, very useful historical perspective of the possible ways that uh, uh, people might have thought about those. For us, you know, um, for us it was just kind of a really cool way of keeping a lot of things exogenous and, you know, finding a way of sort of taking out all the, all the sort of potential endogeneity kinds of things that uh, would, would uh, make the, the, the pure, clean way of estimating these setter effects possible. So when we found Oregon and we said, isn't it nice, you know, that in these 50 states, people did weird things like this, uh, and this was one of them. But, but thanks for reminding us that these weird things actually happen because people are trying to accomplish certain goals. I don't know if you're right about the motivations, but it certainly sounds plausible. Okay, thanks. No, oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, I have a couple of questions. So it seems from the table you presented where uh, we look at the variation of revenue and the proportion of school district going one way or another, it seems that most of the change is coming from districts that move from being having a negative change to a zero change. 
And if I understand correctly, there are some districts that have like the base rate, that is like previous expenditure plus six percent, and some districts that don't have this at all. And I think it would be, I, I feel, it would, to me, it would be just interesting to see the table with, for those districts who have the base rate where it's increasing by 6%, and those districts who do not have this base rate at all, and see like the same breakdown of percentages and compare it to tables. And because I think every, since everything is happening from this part of the negative becoming zero, this is, looks like it's the districts that do not have the base rate that become very affected by the measure 12. And also, one <coughs> other point I think would be interesting for me, the data would be to look at if in year T minus one you increase by, let's say, more than 6%, where, where, where are you in your T? Do you move to something where you just don't increase? Do you move to something where you increase by 6%? What is the, how do you move in terms of expenditure from one year to another? Like looking at the dynamics of this trick in this type of breakdown, I think, would be very interesting to try to get a grasp of what is happening with this measure 12. You mean this is after the, after the change? In the or even or so before the change a, and after see, the yeah, change. Yeah, see what the, whether there's actually a shift in the, in the Yeah, how does it pattern. move? Like, do you have like one school ball managing to get like plus 25% to be great, like give crazy number, but then the following year the voters say, wow, that's, that's completely crazy. We're not gonna accept any type of budget, but something that is minus 10%. In the districts that are like that are not affected by that are don't have this base rate or it's something like this. So that that I think to look at this type of pattern I think would be interesting to be able to distinguish maybe where where does the institutional change is, is where is it bind, binding? Yeah. It's a good idea. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks everybody.